The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. These Best You Expo Talks are recorded in front of a live audience in a live event. We highly recommend that you focus on the message. As they say, what you focus on expands. Enjoy. Dr. Steve Simpson. The title of his talk is Get Lucky Now. He regularly appears on TV and radio, and his clients include leading names from the diverse worlds of sport, business, and entertainment industries, and professional poker. I know Dr. Steve Simpson personally very well. We train together as NLP practitioners, master practitioners and trainers. He spoke at several expos, at the Inspiring People Talks. I'm just a big, massive fan of Dr. Steve. I think he is extremely knowledgeable. He has a fantastic career. And uh, yeah, you're just going to love listening to him and his thoughts on being lucky. Thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you for turning up. I'm glad to say for the moment the dancing has stopped over there, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. Um, If you only remember four words of what I say today, it is, luck is not random. Which means that there are things that all of us can do, maybe some small things or maybe some big things, to attract a little more luck into our lives. And as I go through the presentation, we have 45 minutes, I'll try and give you lots of examples of this. Um, You know my name, I'm a a medical doctor by background in emergency medicine. I've uh, been lucky to work all over the world. I've uh, spent seven years in Angola during the Civil War, which sounds dreadful and parts of it were, but parts of it were also very good. Four years in Nigeria, which was also pretty challenging. Three years, I spoke too soon, three years uh, in Kazakhstan shortly after the Soviet Union broke up. So uh, for the last 10 years, however, that chapter of my life came to an end for various reasons. And I've been a mind coach ever since. And I've been able to work with um, people like you and me. I've been able to work with tour golfers. I started with golfers. Um, I've worked with business people and sportsmen from other walks of life. And as I'll probably mention, uh, I don't, probably I don't know how many of you play poker here. Um, I play a little bit. I'm not very good. Uh, but my main client is very good. His name is Chris Mormon, and he's won more money in online poker than any other player. Last time I checked, and I check every day, it was over $13 million dollars. Now, there's a good story uh, about how he and I met because, anyway, I'll come to that later. So where did my, this is, this presentation's about luck. So where did my interest in luck start? It was talking to a group of people like you about three years ago, January 2014. And my seminar then, which was a half day one, was to talk about things that I talked about a lot at that time. And it was health, wealth, and happiness. Because if you're a mind coach or a personal development coach, there's no point talking about stuff if you're the only one who's interested in it. But most people, I found, are interested in health, wealth, and happiness. Any one of those, but all three, would be absolutely wonderful. And when I say wealth, by the way, I don't just mean money. I mean the richness that life has. So I was introducing those three subjects very briefly just to get started, to see what kind of uh, audience I had. And then I just had a thought, which can be very dangerous. I had a a voice whispering in my ear saying, change the script. Not that there ever is a script, but I'd mentioned health, wealth, and happiness. And then I said, would you, if it were possible, would you like to attract more luck into your life? And as soon as I said those words, I could tell the atmosphere in the whole room had changed. I could see the body language where people were sitting forward. And, um, and I got sort of goosebumps. I was going to say my hair stood on end, but uh, that would be a slight exaggeration. But I knew 
there was something in this word luck, certainly with that group and with many of the groups that I've spoken to since. So why? What is so special about this word luck? And it took me, as a, when, you, when you're dealing with a mind where there's so many question marks and so little science to support a lot of things, it took me on a journey where I tr tried to find where some of our emotions come from. And then the big thing, as President Trump knows, we all want to control. And is there any way that we can control some of our emotions that previously we might have thought are beyond our control? And the answer I came to is quite clearly, yes, there are some things. And I'm going to demonstrate some of those this afternoon. And I'm going to give you a technique that you can all walk, walk, walk away with and use yourself. And if you can get just a little bit of control, just like if you can get a little bit of extra luck, that can make a huge difference. And the more competitive the field you are in, in, in business or running your own businesses or being a poker player, those little edges can add up to make a lot of difference. Now, I said I'm a mind coach. That means that I play with brains. And I, and I went down the road. I live in the East End to the Royal London Hospital. And I said, is it possible I can borrow a brain, you know, for a couple of hours? And I promised to treat it kindly and return it. And they got very iffy. So I had to go to the tiger shop instead, where they were quite happy. They wouldn't give me a real one, but they were quite happy to sell me uh, a, a toy one, which is pretty much anatomically correct in a very l gross way. The brain split into two halves. That's quite important. We won't talk about that today, but it is important because both halves do different jobs and um, will dictate to some extent the kind of things in life that you're good at and that you like doing. But the bit of the brain that now interests me the most is this bit underneath. And it's, uh, it's called, in colloquial terms, it's called the reptilian brain. Because when we are in the womb, we go through an embryological development which actually goes through the whole of evolution. And we have bits of us that come from reptiles, bits of us that come from fish and birds. And even as adults, some of these things persist. And it's just the same in the brain. And this area deep down here, that must have been the first part of the brain that we started to use. And that's why they call it the reptile brain. And the thing that's most important to all of us, Maslow wrote about this, is our survival. That's the most important thing of all. When we're in a certain circumstance and our life depends on it, human beings, as we know, are capable of just about anything. Just about anything that is really, really good, or sadly, just about anything that is quite the opposite of that. And so all of, many of the emotions come from this part of the brain called the reptile brain. And you don't need to remember this, and you probably won't be able to spell it, but it's from this thing they call the amygdala. And that's been on a lot of TV programs recently. And many, many, here's another prop. I use this because it's the best sort of metaphor I can make. But you've all seen these kind of snowstorm type things. And you shake it up and all of these things go round and round and round. And if you give it long enough, they will start to settle down. And you definitely won't see this from the back. But you be a word becomes clear. It doesn't matter what the word is. It doesn't matter what it is at all, even if it's not a word. But the word particularly here is love. And that's a pretty good word, I reckon. But the analogy that I use is that this is like our brain. Because our brain is going round and round and round like this. The scientists, they tell us, and don't ask me how they calculated this, they say we have 70,000 thoughts every single day. Now, that would be just like your computer at home. There is no way your brain can process that many thoughts. So there are higher centers above the, rect the reptile brain that pick and choose which of these they want to put their focus on and bring into their consciousness. Now, you probably know this already, the unconscious mind is by far the biggest part of your brain. The conscious mind, which is the only bit by definition that we're aware of, is actually quite a small part of the brain. So if, you're, if you want to unlock hidden powers of your mind, 
You can do it definitely by improving the function of your conscious brain. But if you could do it on your unconscious mind, you're going to get a magnified effect. And all of my work that I do with my clients is their unconscious mind. And I will be using some of the techniques right now, right here in this room. Because when I'm talking here, I'm not really using my conscious mind. I mean, I have a rough idea of how the time is going and the kind of things that people may or may not be interested in and a rough idea of what I'm going to say. But the most important thing is that I'm not, de- I'm not depending on my conscious mind and I'm not depending on yours either because the most important uh, method that I use is that I use my unconscious mind to communicate, hopefully, to establish some sort of resonance with your unconscious mind too. And that's when major change takes place. And you'll be familiar with this because there will be an activity that you you are good at, that you enjoy doing, that takes you into another place where time is distorted. It could be be, um, creating a work of art. It could be uh, even going for a walk in the country. It could be playing a musical instrument. These things are all creative things and creativity, it doesn't come from the conscious mind. In fact, any actor will tell you, any author will tell you that they want to get out of their conscious mind. They want to know what's underneath and bring some of this stuff out. Now, what does this have to do with the brain and, and everything else? Well, I'm back to my friend the amygdala here because I mentioned that this is a primitive part of the brain and I mentioned that survival always comes first. And a lot of the emotions that we have are going to be connected one way or another to our survival. It may not be a matter of life and death, but it will be very important to us. And something that might be important to you is going to be very different from something that's going to be important to you. We are all different. And many of, these, many of these primitive emotions can be hardwired from a very early age. Now, examples of primitive emotions, perhaps the, most, the best example, is anger or rage. Because when we're threatened, we know we fight or we run away or, or we just freeze. A lot of people forget the freeze thing. But that's, that happens in nature a lot with animals, even the reptiles. And I mentioned earlier that your mind will try and make sense of these 70,000 thoughts and select a few of them. Now, again, the scientists tell us that we can only think about seven things at any one time. And that's not very much. Now, think about how you spend your life with all of the different things you have to do. Now more than ever, the, 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 uh, the iPhone, the, the, the texting, the emails, the breaking news, you're always connected with loads of information. And I mean, the inventors of these gadgets did a fantastic job, but in some ways they made our life a lot more difficult. And when I talk to teachers, they will certainly agree with that statement because they find it hard to get their ideas into the kids' heads because the kids' heads are full of so much other stuff. So you choose, we choose, one of these thoughts. And the the thought that is screaming the loudest, coming from the amygdala, coming from survival, is the thought we're going to latch onto. Now, unfortunately for us, most of those kind of thoughts are going to be the bad ones because the amygdala is doing its job. It says, Steve... Keep out of trouble. Remember what happened last time when this situation came. So it's a protective thing. The problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, some of these these thoughts got hardwired the wrong way to be warning signs to us from incidents when we were children, which at that time were very important to us. But as an adult, we should be able to look back and say, well, these were pretty trivial. But we all know about phobias. We know about people who have been exposed to spiders when they're kids. And 60 years later, they can't go into a room where there's spiders. So that makes it quite um, quite difficult to find that calm place in your unconscious mind where great things happen, where the artists do their fantastic bits of work and the actors turn on, you know, their grade A performance by being able to get deep in. There are ways we can do it. 
Um, I won't be, have time to cover very much of this today, but um, this is a very sort of gentle advertising plug. I have got a book out about Get Lucky Now. I'm over the stand there, happy to talk about luck, and these are available at uh, the cheapest price. I mean, they're only on Amazon anyway, but they're a little bit cheaper for me. Um, but in, in there, one of the secrets, I, there are about seven secrets, and I got these seven secrets. I didn't invent any of them. Um, copied is too strong a word, but I studied people throughout history who have been lucky. Napoleon said uh, when he was asked what kind of general he wanted to recruit or to put into a major position, he said, I'm only interested in generals who are lucky. And I started off by saying luck is not random. Well, Napoleon presumably knew that because there are some people who make their own luck. And I think you'll have heard that expression before. And um, I've, I've spoken to so many people about luck now, and a very common question or statement I get from, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. The harder I work, the luckier I get. You familiar with that? Quite a lot of nodding heads. Yeah. Nobody actually knows who said that first. I've tried to find out. There are so many people that claim the fame to that one. And whilst it's true, because all of the elite performers that I work with, there's no question they work hard, no question at all. But the, the important thing is they're doing stuff that they like. Now, that isn't listed as a secret, but it easily could be. Because if you're doing stuff that you don't like, and I know we have to pay the mortgage and all things like that, but if you're doing stuff that you don't like, you'll find it very hard to find this place we call the zone. And you'll find it hard to be lucky. People who follow their passion, they, they, they win twice. Because first of all, they don't see it as work. And secondly, they don't need any motivation to put the hours in. If you're interested in sharing your story, sharing your dreams, sharing your ideas in the largest personal development platform, The Best You Expo, sign up today. Go to www.thebestyouexpo.com or send an email to info at the best you .co. Now, there's, there's somebody, uh, there's somebody who, in some, many of these books that you'll read, they will say, to be an expert in anything, you have to study it and practice it for 10,000 hours. That's a long time. Very roughly, it's 10 years. Now, nobody, nobody, we're hardwired for instant gratification. If, some, if you give a promise to somebody 10 years away, they're not going to be very interested. People want stuff now. And that's why, you know, I wrote this book, because... I'm not saying you don't have to work hard or put the hours in. You do, but there are some easy ways to do it. Now, this expression, the harder I work, the luckier I get, it's always said with a, you know, a furrowed brow, like it has to be hard. And there's truth in it, but it's not the whole truth. It is not the whole truth, because there are some people who have exactly the same opportunities, the same qualifications, um, the same goals, and we know them, who sail through life, and others who work really, really hard and they never get there. Primitive emotion. I'll tell you, there's part of our brain that is jealous of them because these emotions are primitive. But being jealous of somebody like that is not going to help you. You should applaud them. When you come across successful people, say, yeah, that's wonderful, because it is wonderful. And it's going to be wonderful for you as well, because that's a, a way of changing your brain chemistry, turning a negative into a positive. Every single client that I come across, I will do a check. Um, I obviously want to know what their goals are. And then as soon as we know what their goals are, we will metaphorically rip that up and throw it on the floor. Because most of the goals that people come up with, a lot of thought has gone into them. They're not bad goals. Uh, and they may well, may, may well be very true of what that person wants to achieve. But by putting it in a form like that makes it less likely that they're going to. I mentioned Chris Mormon. Because um, last year I was busy writing two books. And this one's called Poker Genius. The secrets are all pretty much those. But they put in language that a poker player um, can understand. And Chris wanted to... Uh, I mentioned already he's won more money online than any other poker player, but one thing he'd never done, he'd never won a live event, you know, one of these big tournaments in Las Vegas or somewhere. 
And he was getting tired of people coming to him and saying, you know, are you going to go down in history as the best poker player who's never won a live event? And that's why he came to see me. And he is quite honest about this. He didn't want to see me. His partner, now wife, pushed him into it. And the only, time, the only way I could see him was in, um, I had to fly to Vancouver. Uh, no contract, no nothing. I just, Chris was making so many excuses. I, I said, where are you next week? He said, I'm in Vancouver. I said, see you there. I put the phone down and then I, I really did. I bu booked a ticket. I must have been crazy. Probably am. Um, but what happened then was not crazy. I worked with him for three days. And it, as soon as he started to get what I was talking about, he was the perfect student. And I still work with Chris three years later. And um, he, you know, he continues to do really well. So his goal, you see, when I asked him, was I want to win a major live event. And I said, that's not going to work, Chris. Can't work with that one. And I knew he wanted to run out the door. I could see that. I, I could see him thinking, I told, I told her, I told her. I told her this was a waste of time. I'm going. But I said, no, the reason is you're not in control of your next event. You're not in control. I started to think about it then a bit. So what, when you're playing poker, what are you in control of? He thought again, quite a long time. And he said, when you put it like that, I'm not in charge, of, I'm not in control of very much. This control word that I mentioned earlier on, the power word. I said, no, you're not, Chris. So all of the work that we're going to do together from now is we're going to be looking at those few things that you can control. And he said, well, like what? I said, well, you tell me. You know poker better than I do. Um, what what's, can you control? He said, well, probably only, I can only think of one thing at the moment. I can give on every hand that I'm dealt. I will make sure I give it my maximum focus. Even though I'm playing for 12 hours every day for seven days in a, in a major tournament, I will commit to that. I said, if you can do that, Chris, you have nothing to worry about. Well, I had plenty to worry about because... I'd gone all the way to Vancouver and, uh, okay, we started to repair a bit of the damage. But I was out of pocket, as you can imagine, no contract or anything like that. But I got lucky and Chris got lucky because three weeks later, one of the biggest tournaments of the year, the Los Angeles Classic, he won his first live event over a million dollars. Now, people will say that's coincidence, it's variance, and it may well be. I don't deny that. But the fact is, is that all the people I was working with at that time in poker, they were all doing well. And if it's variance, I say, I'll take it, you know, give me more. But the reason why I mentioned Chris is that um, the second thing I've, I've mentioned, I, first of all, I ask about the goal. And secondly, I would say, this is just a health check. I say, is there anything in the past that might have happened to you? That is a kind of a block. It may be a very, very trivial thing. And you don't have to give me a lot of details, but is there anything? And a lot of people, more than I imagined when I started this career, a lot of people say, well, as you mention it, there is. So I have to deal with that because we're not going to make a lot of progress until I have. Now, Chris is just about to publish his second book, and he talks very openly about this, so I can be open with you. Um, he didn't have a very good time at school. That's probably what drove him into the arms of poker. He was bullied and uh, desperately, desperately upset. You know, his parents had put him into a good school. They wanted him to do well. And, uh, and he was being bullied. And I, and I said, well, is, was there, is there any particular, without going into great detail, is there any aspect? He said, yeah, I wanted this new pair of trainers. And I got these new pair of trainers and I came to school and I was so proud and I was showing them to everybody. And they're saying, oh, those are nice, Chris. And he said, when I came back from my sports lesson, they'd been cut up with a pair of scissors. He said, I remember that to this day, which is terrible. And not a, not a unique story by any means. A lot of people have had similar experiences, but it could be something else. It could be a failed relationship. It could, could, be, it could be anything. But we have to deal with that first. And I'm going to um, give you a, a, a technique that you can use for that and also for other things that you want in your life as well. And the technique is called... Havening. Have any of you heard of Havening? Yes, just only a couple. Yeah, it's, it's a very low profile thing, hasn't been around for very long. And it's simple. You can all do Havening to yourself, and I'm going to show you how. And just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's not powerful. 
and it's an easier thing for me to demonstrate than to uh, explain and talk to you. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I think a demonstration is probably worth a million words. And so I need somebody to demonstrate this with, and I have that, this person already. It was a person who dropped by my stand this morning, and I was just talking to her because she's an interesting story. Another lady dropped by my stand, by the way, who's also an interesting story because she's just read my book and she's had three bits of great luck in a very short period of time. She's very much looking forward to her um, helicopter, to her balloon trip and a first-class hotel and playing with her three PlayStation 4s. Anyway, but back to, back to this lady who dropped by my stand. She has had a very frightening thing happen to her. And I felt guilty talking to her. It is so frightening that I'm not going to say any more about it because she's in this room and right now uh, some of these feelings will be coming back. And it's something that I hate doing. As a therapist, as a doctor, it's absolutely the opposite of how I want things to be. But sometimes, I, I haven't found any way through this. If you recall a memory, you can't deal with it until it is recalled. This lady's name is Ashley. She, I can assure you she's been very brave. It took me quite a bit of convincing and quite a bit of trust on her part to be my demonstration subject. So would you please give us some encouragement, <laughs> Ashley? I'm happy for you to share that um, I was stalked by this guy. Okay. So that gives Can I t- do I say what your job is or not? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, Ashley's... Thank you. Uh, you, you just speak into that when I say, but uh, um, Ashley works as uh, in uh, a secure secure unit for um, criminals with the most serious conditions, and as you can imagine, it's not a very nice environment to be in. And she's been there for ten years, and the thing I wasn't going to mention anything at all, but she's just told me that it's okay to tell you a little bit. She was attacked by one of these people, and it was terrifying for her. It was, it was a man. And she's dealt with it very well. She's a very strong person, but it's still there. Uh, she gets flashbacks, and a loud male voice can be enough to trigger these emotions. These are fairly typical reactions. And some people would call this post-traumatic stress disorder, and I, I think that it probably is. But I'm more interested in seeing if I can put this thought into a different place so that it can take literally a huge weight off her shoulders. And that's what I'm going to do right now. In fact, I don't think we need the mic because I'm probably... Well, I'll I'll hold it in my hand in case I need to talk to you. But actually, would you hold it for me? Yeah, I might need it again in a minute. Okay. I want you to close your eyes... Oh, first of all, I must never, ever forget this. Never, ever forget this. Is it okay if I touch you on your arm like this, okay? I promise my hand will be nowhere near your... <laughs> near your money. <laughs> Good luck with Yeah, that. yeah. Okay. Um, now, as well as being um, a therapist, I'm, I'm also a hypnotherapist. So I use elements of very, very gentle hypnosis. You don't need to do this for the havening technique, but I find that it makes things faster and easier. So c- close your eyes, Ashley. We're going to go on a little walk. Uh, I'm going to be with you for the first part of the walk. And I don't know whether you like hot places or not, but where I thought we'd go to on some of these air miles that Amanda has won. How about Cairo? Lovely. Yeah, lovely. Going to climb the pyramids, yeah? Yeah. There's a couple of problems, though, which I didn't tell her about before she got on the plane. First of all, we've gone right at the hottest time of the year, and it really is hot. And there's that sandy wind blowing, which isn't terribly pleasant. The other thing is, I don't think she realized how high a pyramid is and how high the steps are and how physically tiring it is to climb those steps. And I certainly didn't mention 
that I've given her my bag to carry because I've got a bad back. I couldn't possibly carry it. And because she's a nice, kind person, she agreed. So she's got the rucksack on her bag right now. And it is heavy, isn't it? Yes, it is. She's trying to smile. Okay. Now let's start our climb. As you go up every step, I want you to count out just in a, in a quiet voice. I want you to count from one and keep going until I tell you to stop. Starting now. If you're interested in speaking, exhibiting, or getting involved in the largest personal development expos in the world, contact us today at www.thebestyouexpo.com or send us an email to info at thebestyou.co. And now she's really noticing how big these steps are. And of every step she takes, my word, is my bag heavy? What on earth did Steve put in my bag? And those legs are starting to hurt now. I know ladies don't sweat, but there are limits. Okay, stop where you are for a moment, actually. Keep your eyes closed. Because we've come quite a long way, and I know it was fairly difficult. But with your eyes closed, in your mind's eye, just look around, see what you can see. There's a good view from here. You know, you only need to be six inches higher than, an, higher than another person, and you can see right over them. So it is with a pyramid. There's lots of interesting things to see. But our journey's not finished yet. Let's carry on a little bit more with this bag. And while you weren't looking, I put a couple of other things in, but don't tell her. So off we go again, counting from one. Good. Yeah, that's the way. Four. Yeah, you're getting tired, huh? Tired, tired, tired. Okay, stop where you are. Stop where you are. I'm going to do you a favor. The punishment's gone on too, too long. I'm going to take the bag off your shoulders. So off it comes. I put the bag down on the ground. How does that feel? A bit lighter? Yes. Yeah? A bit lighter. Yeah. Up the hill. Up you go. Come on. We're almost at the top. Keep going. Keep counting. Keep counting. One, two. Two. Mm. Three. Mm. Four. Five. This is easier. Six, it's almost fun. Seven. Okay. Stop right there. Again, in your mind's eye. You've got a wonderful view now. Look around, see everything there is to see in this wonderful country. And out of the corner of your eye as you look down, you can see my bag. But it's a lot smaller because it's a lot further away. Yeah. And it looks old, actually. It looks all cobwebby and sandy. It looks quite, quite rubbishy. And... Uh, not very easy to see actually it's not only is it small but it's like out of focus and you might be guessing by now what's in that bag are you guessing Ashley <laughs> you're laughing you, am I reading your am I reading your mind right you know what's in there don't you rubbish rubbish yeah tell me a little more about it. what do you think what particular kind of rubbish might it be rubbish from my past yeah. Now, I'm not sure that rubbish is the word that I chose because I told you this, this was a terribly serious incident. And um, it might, rubbish may not be the word, but it's the word that Ashley chose. And I have a feeling that that's a good word for her. Because the point is, Ashley, that we can't change the past. None of us can change the past. I mentioned earlier control. We can change the way we think about stuff. Sometimes we need a little help to do it. And I'm giving you a little help now because I've moved this into a different part of your brain. I suppose if I worked long enough, I could make you forget about it entirely, but that wouldn't be the right thing to do. But I definitely want to put it into a different place where it can't hurt you anymore. Because there are plenty of places where you go where you know you're going to be perfectly safe perfectly safe and just because you hear a man's voice doesn't mean that you're about to be attacked and you know that don't you yes yeah 
But when you looked down at that bag that was there, you were laughing, weren't you? Yeah. Would you have believed that that was possible? No. I've got the mic for you. Keep your eyes closed. Would you have believed that that was possible? No. No. So what do you think has happened? <laughs> I don't know, but it's amazing. Yeah. And, and I told you I felt guilty when I was talking to you, because I did. Because I, I you know, bullied is too strong a word. But I, I didn't want you to leave here. I didn't want you to leave this building without letting me spend a few minutes with you. And by coming up here, we've done that. But you've also shown the other people in this room a technique that in a moment they can start to use. But I think you've demonstrated how powerful that is. I asked you on a score of 0 to 10 earlier this morning what it was, and you went straight to 10. You didn't yes. need to do any mental arithmetic, did you? No. No. Where would you put it now? One. One. Yeah. Well, keep in, keep in touch with me, but I'm thrilled with that, and I'm thank you for being so brave and being so generous. Please have a seat and give her a warm hand, please. Well done. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you never know how a demonstration is going to work out. I'd love to be able to tell you that havening is 100%, but that nothing ever is. But it's really good for, it's really good for post-traumatic stress. And don't take my word for it. Uh, the SAS are using it. It's being used with Gulf War veterans. It's being used in schools. It, it's being used in prisons. And I think you're going to see a massive increase in the use of it. Paul McKenna describes it as um, the best therapeutic tool in 25 years. He normally has a tendency, you know, to talk big about stuff, big numbers. I think it's more than that. I think it's 125 years because psychiatry doesn't, not deservedly, it doesn't deserve it, but it's been considered a specialty that hasn't had the focus and attention and resources it should have done. There have been advances in mental health. There have been new drugs that sometimes help. There's been CBT which has been proven to be of benefit. But I haven't seen anything as profound as, uh, as, as havening for this. Thank you for this. Um, so I did say now, how can you use this yourself for circumstances that are far less serious than actually? Well, let's think about Chris, or let's think about something you want to achieve in your life. You, you all know, have a rough idea of what your goals are. Yeah? Yeah. Um, can somebody just put their hand up who's got a, a goal they can just share with us so that I can use it? You won't have to come up here, but it's just so we can talk about it. Can you say that again for you? I think with the, mic, the mic's on now. Yeah. Um, I want yeah. to set up my own company. Sorry? Set up my own company. You want to set up your own company. I'm quite sure there's a few people in this room who would want to do the same. That gentleman's smiling. And, um, yeah, if anybody told you it's easy to run your own company, by the way, it's not. But you've got to have the passion inside you to do it. So what resource, if, what, what emotion or what resource or what quality would you like to have in yourself in one word that would help you to do that? Confidence. Confidence. Okay. So. Th thank you. So this is how it works. And it works for you. What, you just think of the word that you want to move forward in your life, something you want to aspire to. Now, this is how it's going to... What's your name, by the way? Hattie. 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 Okay, Hattie. If I was working with you and you'd said confidence, I would want you to do this. With your eyes closed. Not do, don't do it just now. Well, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Put your pen down. Do it while I'm... Yeah. Close your eyes and do this to yourself. Um, you know... The speed that's appropriate for you, yes, feel free, all of you, to do it. Uh, pressing as hard or as soft as you like. There's no rules for this one. And be saying to yourself, it's got to be three words. It's got to be in the present tense. And those words are for you, I am confident. Close your eyes. I am confident. Keep on saying that. Okay. Keep on going. I am confident. I am confident. You are confident. Hattie, you are confident. You are confident. You got the mic on, mic on please. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay, uh, yep, take a rest. How, do you, how, do, how does that feel? Good, yeah. yeah, nodding ahead. Mm-hmm. Can you give me a word? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it yeah. feels really good. Yeah. Okay, now why, and for, you, for the others of you, did you feel something going on here, even though we were very quick and all the rest of it? So what is the explanation? I wish I could tell you. I can only come up with my own theory. My own theory is that it's this reptile brain thing again. Mothers instinctively know what to do when their child is distressed. They put an arm around them or they stroke their arm. So this is something that people are born with. And it's not just women, it's all of us. When somebody's in distress, it's a natural reaching out. One of the sad things of modern medicine is now that, you know, doctors are not allowed to touch their patients. You know, if you put, or, or coaches, as I'm a coach. I go to sporting events with my clients. In theory, I can't put my arm around them. That's considered improper behavior in some quarters. I think that's a shame because I think touch is something that, again, we've had forever and ever and has very healing qualities. So I think this is one of these ancient reflexes. We've always known how to do it. Um, Speech came late to us in life. I think hypnosis is a form of speech late late in our evolution. I think this reflex, whatever it's called, is... um, is, is there and I, you don't need to know how it works but I can guarantee it works and, and I think every one of my clients all, you know, there's bound to be an exception or two but they all use this I know people in the media who are on TV all the time and anybody who's been in front of a camera live they will know how stressful that is they will find a quiet way of just doing this or if it's too obvious they will do it in their mind and I definitely use this myself and I find it brings a sense of calm So this is a way that we get into, uh, uh, one of the ways that we can connect more closely with our unconscious mind, which is kind of really my core message. You're not going to find the next work of art in your conscious mind. You're going to find it deeper down. And don't tell me, or don't even think it, don't, don't think it, don't think that you're not creative, because some people do think that. They think, I can't paint. I can't dance, I can't play a musical instrument. You can, because another takeaway message, you have more resources inside of you than you can believe. That's an easy thing for me to say, and maybe it's easy for you to believe. The hard thing is, well, how do I find it? And that is, that is harder. You will only find it by going into your unconscious mind. You will not find it when people are shouting at you. You will not find it when, you, when people are putting you under pressure. You will not find it when you're putting yourself under pressure. Okay, I've, just, I've got about a couple of minutes left, and uh, I will take some questions at this time. Or anybody want to ask any questions? There's a gentleman here. Use the mic again, please. The exercise you just did was obviously temporary. Does that have long-term effects or does it have to be repeated? Okay, good question. Did I say that it was temporary? No. My experience is that it's permanent. I can't guarantee that. Uh, Some people need to come back and have it again. But, I mean, uh, Dr. Ron Rudin, who is the creator of this movement, he is a um, neuropharmacologist and physiologist and, and doctor, and he knows words that you'll never be able to pronounce. He says that uh, a memory gets encoded in the amygdala through a phosphate bond, and somehow this reflex breaks that phosphate bond. And when it's broken, it's broken. So certainly that's my experience. As I say, this has only been around in this country for three years, but uh, that's been my experience. Uh, Another question? Gentlemen? Thanks, Leon. You were talking about using just three words. Is that crucial? Uh, it's not crucial, but I think, uh, I think uh, it's only a thought. I think that it's easier. I think the simpler we make things for our brain in general, the easier it, it is for us. I know people who've used four, and I've not been able to convince them to change, and uh, they may well uh, be better for them than three. So it doesn't have to be three, but it, the important thing is it has to be in the present tense. A lot of people, when they think of what they want, they're talking about the future, and the future is too far away. We live in the moment, and the more we live in the moment, the better. So that's why the tense is important. 
Yeah. Okay, one more quick question. Yeah. And then I'm, this will be the last, I think. Hi, yeah. I just remembered that I heard somewhere in the news in the last couple of weeks that scientists had found that could wipe out memories in mice. They've been doing some research about actually changing the chemicals in their brain to take away the memories altogether. Is that based on the same phosphate bonds? Have you heard I, of that? I, I think I heard about... Did you all hear the question? Yeah. Um, I, I think I've read about that recently... And what you say is true. Now, what I don't know, I did, did they do any surgery on the brain? Do you know? They didn't do it. So um, I can't answer that. I have a feeling it was to do with, was it diet? Was, am I right? What do, you, what, do you, what do you remember? I think it was something to do with chemi- uh, some sort of chemical intervention, so a medication type yeah. of intervention. Yes, I, I think you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, That's, you, you know more than I do, so I can't answer that question. But there's new, there's new developments all the time. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the final frontier, the mind. So, in, in summary, um, basically I'd like to thank um, the, the crew who've kept me on time and kept my microphone working. Um, But mainly, I would like to thank all of you for being brave, for coming here, for embracing a few new ideas. And I'd particularly like to thank Ashley again. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day. See you around. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.